good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm, I'm glad that we have this opportunity tonight to have the New Hearth family join us and share with us a special program uh, of music and uh, other information. It's going to be very encouraging, I am sure. And so I'd like to start out with just a, a prayer and uh, want to ask you throughout this program uh, just to really try to tune into what the words um, that are coming across, what the message is, so that you can receive more than just the blessing of the good music, but actually hear what God is trying to say to us to encourage us this evening. Um, also, want to let you know before I have prayer that there will be an opportunity to give donations um, to this family uh, after the program, there will be a little basket outside. If, if you'd like to give a donation, that would be great. Um, so let's have prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be in your house tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of not only the Sabbath, but the gift of a church family and the gift of this visiting family that is going to share their ministry with us. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and that indeed you will be in control of everything that is said and done here tonight. So we invite you here to inhabit this place and let the influence of your holy angels abound here. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Don't you see my Jesus coming? Don't you see in yonder cloud? With ten thousand angels round him, see how they my Jesus crowd. I am bound for the kingdom, will you go to glory with me? Alleluia, oh praise ye the Lord. Don't you see his arms extended? Don't you hear his charming voice? Each loving heart beats high for glory. Oh, my Jesus is my choice. I am bound for the kingdom. Will you go to glory with me? Alleluia. Oh, praise ye the Lord. Don't you see the saints ascending? Hear them shouting through the air. Jesus, smiling, trumpet sounding, now his glory they will share. I am bound for the kingdom, will you go to glory with me? Alleluia, oh praise ye the Lord. Greetings, and happy Friday, or yes, Friday evening, happy Sabbath. What you just experienced is how a church service or camp meeting may have begun in the 1800s by James White. He would come walking down the aisle, thumping his Bible, and singing this hymn. I am David, and we are the New Hearth family. For decades I came to church and participated each Sabbath. But God desired a daily personal relationship with me. In 2013, our family went on a mission trip to Panama to help build a church. And I discovered the true joy of sacrificial giving and living for Christ. Yeah. I've continued to be inspired as we've gone on five more mission trips and helped complete 27 churches. As I've committed to read the Bible every day, I've discovered how great a sinner I am and in need of a savior. Hello, I'm Levi, I'm 16 years old. I love spending time with God's nature and we, I wanna be a general contractor and a missionary to Bushapot when I'm older. Hello, I'm Lucas, I'm 17 years old and I love to play the harmonica and the violin and uh, my goal to be, is to be a missionary bush pilot and a mechanic in Alaska. Good evening, my name is Lisa, and I do not feel old enough to be their mom, but I guess I am somehow. The years have gone by flying. They all just had birthdays, so it's like sinking in. I was very blessed to be raised in a Seventh-day Adventist home. 
But as I became a teenager, I rebelled against what I would call at the time the hypocrisy I saw in the church and in my home. However, looking back, if I was so smart to see the hypocrisy, I should have been smart enough to stay on the straight and narrow. But I chose to go out into the world to try to fill that hole in my heart. And as I began to do that, and as I began to reap the painful consequences of my decisions, this brought me back to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Since then, I have discovered that living life with Christ is ridiculously better than I could have ever imagined it. Good evening. I'm Benjamin. I am 13 years old. I love to play piano and violin, and I want to be a pilot, a mechanic, and a missionary here in the U.S. when I'm older, because I personally think that the U.S. needs missionaries the most right now. Amen. Our ministry is entitled New Hearts for Christ. It is a play on our last name and reflects our desire for God to create in each one of us a new heart through the reading of his word and allowing him to change our hearts and minds from that sinful state to a holy state. In 2017, we spent four months living in a motor home and drove 17,000 miles through 44 states to historical places around the United States. And we went to many Adventist heritage sites and were inspired as we read the stories and looked at the history. As we shared our experience along the road on our trip, each Sabbath we'd go to a different church, just kind of pop in. Um, we noticed both young and old enjoyed our testimony and song and told us we should begin a ministry. So almost two years later, here we are. I pray these stories and songs will glorify God and draw us all closer to Christ this evening. When, um, when we're finished, everything that we do in our ministry is completely free. This is our family's um, method of spreading the gospel. So when we're done, on the back is a CD to listen to and a DVD that you can watch that's filmed outside in the beautiful Pacific Northwest of the same program we're doing tonight, The Midnight Cry. We also have a CD of Benjamin with hymns, and we have a bookmark um, that has our website on it. And on that website, we did just publish another CD this week. You can download it for free. Again, you can share those bookmarks with other people because anybody can go on there and download it, watch all of those things for free. The new one we just put on is called Growing in Christ, which is our personal testimony combined with about 13 gospel songs. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It paid my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, he will answer by and by. Sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day The midst of sin may rise and hide the starry skies But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way Now let us have a little talk with Jesus Let us tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry and He will answer by and by Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in no little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but my Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus, oh, makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus. Find a little talk with Jesus. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. William Miller was born.
born in 1782 in Massachusetts. He was the oldest of 16 children and he was raised in a farmer's family. His mother taught him to read using the Bible. At a very young age, it was noted that he was physically strong and intellectually bright. When he married, he moved to his wife's hometown and he became a deist, which means he believed God made the world and he did not desire a personal relationship with him nor interfere in, in their lives. William was well liked in the social circle and for amusement he would frequently make fun of preachers and religious matters. He had two Baptist pastors in the family and when they would desperately attempt to evangelize him, he would silence them very quickly by showing them contradicting Bible verses. On September 11, 1814, William Miller stood on the banks of Lake Champlain as he fought as a captain in the war against Great Britain. There were only 5,500 American soldiers compared to 11,000 well-armed British with their ships. During battle, a mortar exploded right beside Miller. But at the end of the day, he was alive and the Americans had won that battle. That day, Miller knew beyond a doubt there was a God who had intervened to miraculously save his life and completely change the course of world history. After the war, Miller moved back to his hometown and to appease his mother, he would attend church. But he complained about the boring deacons who would read the sermons when the pastor was away. So his mother made arrangements for Miller to read a sermon. As Miller got up to read a sermon on parenting, he was deeply convicted of his sins and he saw a beautiful, loving savior. He decided to try reading the Bible for himself from the beginning to the end. When Miller finished, he discovered there was not a single contradiction in the entire Bible. He also discovered that the prophecy of Daniel 8:14 was about to be fulfilled. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Well, he reasoned, the sanctuary must be earth and thus the cleansing must be Christ's second coming. As Miller discovered this truth, however, he just wanted to keep quiet and keep farming. But he kept hearing a voice, go, tell it to the world. This voice followed him for 13 years. Miller was so sick and tired of this, he made a deal with God. If someone asked him to preach, he would preach. Within half an hour, his nephew, who had left home on horseback the day before, arrived and asked him to preach. Miller was furious at God. He ran outside in a rage. He did not want to preach because he feared he was wrong, but he decided to keep his end of the bargain. When he returned home from preaching, there was yet another invitation, and Miller spent the next 12 years giving over 4,500 lectures to half a million people across America. Some people thought that Miller was crazy. There was a doctor spreading a rumor in town that Miller was a monomaniac. So when one of his kids was sent, was sick, he sent for that doctor. At the end of the doctor's visit, he told the doctor he had heard this rumor in town, and he asked the doctor if he would be able to diagnose a monomaniac if he saw one. The doctor said, well, of course. So Miller presented his understanding of Daniel 8, 14, and when he was finished, the doctor believed. As I look at the life of William Miller, I see there's only one way to come to know Christ, and that is through me personally reading the scriptures. We cannot rely upon our parents, pastors, spouse, church, or anyone else for our salvation. We are not saved by being a Seventh-day Adventist or Christian in name, but we are saved by our personal relationship with Jesus Christ alone. His word, the Bible, is his primary method of communicating with each one of us here this evening. It provides real solutions to our everyday struggles. As the Lord convicted me that I needed to have daily personal Bible studies, Satan attacked hard, and for years I would give up. It's like when times were hard, I'd read my Bible, but when times were easy, I'd just be too busy. One day after another rough day, I said, I'm gonna be up tomorrow morning again reading my Bible. And someone said, and how long is it gonna last this time? The truth of those words cut me to the core. Out of stubbornness, I said, this time it's lasting for the rest of my life. As I began to embark on that commitment, though I discovered that it was harder than I first thought. I thought, you know, I finally made a lifelong commitment. It should be all easy from here down. But you know, after a few months of prayer and Bible study, God miraculously worked in our family. And our whole family, after returning home from a mission trip, said, you know what, we really need to be individually reading our Bibles before coming together for family worship. And that is when our individual lives and our family lives really began to change. That is when God was able to speak to us, guide us into truth, work miracles, and become our personal intimate savior. I challenge each one of us here this evening to commit to being a people of the word, to commit to being a child of Jesus Christ and reading his word every day. It will be our guide to life. 
the joy that we will find in those words will be able to get us through any challenge here and into heaven above with him forever. Harmon was born in 1827 in Maine. Ellen desperately wanted to become a school teacher, but at the age of nine, as she was walking home from school, a fellow student threw a rock and hit Ellen in the head. She was carried home, and there she lay in a coma for three weeks, expected to die. Her father, upon returning home from a trip, asked, who is this child who has suffered such a terrible accident? The fact that her very own father didn't even recognize her cut her to the core. She attempted to return to school, but she was unable to physically and mentally endure it. As Ellen lay ill around the house, she sank into a very deep and dark depression. When she was 12, William Miller came to their church and preached on getting ready to meet Jesus. Ellen went forward to show her desire for salvation, but in her heart she was secretly convinced that she was unworthy to be a child of God. Later, she attended a camp meeting where she heard that God extends his mercy to all, that we only need to reach out our hand of faith and claim it, but... She expected some kind of feeling of ecstasy and a true conversion, and she didn't feel anything. So she was worried that she was lost. So at night, she would wrestle at the thought of burning in everlasting hell. But one night, she had a, very, a, a dream of a very kind Jesus. She then confided her fears in her mother and pastor, who assured her, God will never withdraw his hand from anyone who's truly seeking him. She was then filled with joy and peace, and she promised the Lord that she would do anything that he ever asked of her. Even though she had always been too timid to speak in public, that very evening she felt impressed and shared her testimony of what God had done. As a young woman, Ellen married James White, 
a Millerite preacher who, because of health issues, also was unable to attend school as a child, but through God's miracle as a young adult became a preacher, writer, teacher, and editor. Together, they gave their lives wholeheartedly to the Lord's work, but this caused a great sacrifice in their personal lives. They worked a few days a week to support themselves while investing every moment possible in spreading the gospel. They were criticized and rejected by many people, including their own family and even Ellen's own twin sister. They had four sons, but two of them died as children. Despite all of these heartbreaking trials, though, they faithfully, day by day, clung to faith in Jesus and kept on spreading his word. While Ellen only obtained a third grade education, she has written over 100,000 collegiate level manuscript pages. Her books are in our Library of Congress, and she is the most translated nonfiction author in American literature. The words she wrote were most definitely not from her third grade education. They were from God's mouth alone. As a youth, I avoided most of her writings because of the quotes I heard. Later, I decided like William Miller to try reading her for myself. And what I have discovered is powerful words that have grown my love and understanding of Jesus Christ and his word. Each one of us will undergo tests of faith when we come to Christ and live with him. In the spring of 2017, just a few months after we had started reading our Bibles, we heard God's distinct voice tell us to sell. Now for us, this was really abnormal because we had, my husband had spent his whole life living there on the family property and also working for his family. We had bought his aunt's home. We had remodeled it to our own, built a shop. We were uh, deeply involved in our beloved church, and we felt like we were finally getting to that dream life. But we knew that this was what God was asking us to do. But we didn't know where or what he was, where he was taking us. As we began to take that leap of faith that seemed crazy at the time, now, looking back only two and a half years later, we see God's wisdom into his calling us out of there into a, our new home in another part of Washington state. And we're learning to cheerfully obey God, who sees the beginning from the end, and he only asks us to do what is in our very own best interest. Christ has done everything he can for each one of us here this evening. He's created us uniquely just the way we are. He's loved us, died on a cross for us, sent his word and prophets to teach and warn us, and right now he is interceding for us in heaven. He pleads with us to die to self and to accept him as our best friend. He's tenderly waiting for us to come to him so that he can pour out his glorious love and blessings upon us. In my darkness Jesus found me Touched my eyes and made me see Broke sin's chains that long had bound me Gave me life and liberty Oh, glory divine That saved a soul like mine of Daniel 8:14 pointed to October 22, 1844. On that day, Hiram Edson and fellow Millerites gathered in his home to sing as they awaited Jesus' coming. They sang all day, but Jesus did not come. As the clock struck midnight, Hiram later wrote, 
Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I have never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of every earthly friend could have been no comparison. We wept and we wept. I mused in my heart saying, my Advent experience has been the richest and the brightest of all of my Christian experience. If this has proved a failure, what was the rest of my Christian experience worth? Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heavens, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all of this just a cunningly devised fable? We wept and we wept till the day dawned. As the day dawned though, Hiram, as he thought over his life, realized that when brought into straight places, God had always faithfully guided him. At this thought, he and the other men went out to the barn to pray. They prayed in earnest until they sensed that God had heard their prayer and promised to explain the disappointment and make it clear. The men then in faith went inside to eat breakfast. As they were finishing, Hiram said, let's go and encourage some of our friends. As he stepped out of his front porch there and was walking through the cornfield that fall day, all of a sudden Hiram realized the sanctuary was not on earth. The sanctuary was up in heaven. He had never done this before, but he ran inside the house, grabbed his Bible, randomly opened, and there he opened to Hebrews chapter 8 where Paul was discussing Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary above. His impression was grounded in the scriptures. In excitement, the Hirams then sold their wedding silver to pay for a tract to spread this Bible truth. Both Joseph Bates and James White read this, and within a few months, Bates visited Hiram and shared with him the Sabbath truth. Hiram jumped to his feet and said, Brother Bates, this is light and truth, and I am with you to keep the seventh day Sabbath. In 1848, the Edson's farm was the site of an evangelistic Sabbath conference. This launched the Sabbatarian Adventist movement. This soon became the Seventh-day Adventist church. In 1850, Hiram sold his farm and put money towards publishing the truth in the Review and Herald. Hiram then built up another farm and sold it only two years later to fund even more printing work. No matter what, Hiram kept his mind fixed solidly on Jesus Christ in heaven. He never gave up his hope, but he did give up his possessions to spread that hope. When we come to Christ, our trials are not taken away, but God is always present to guide us through them. Hebrews 12, three through five says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I don't know what your suffering is this evening, but I know that God's word is true tonight. As we fix our minds on Jesus Christ, he will personally reveal himself to us and he will faithfully guide us one step at a time. I have fixed my mind on another
I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. Seventh-day Baptists did not believe it was their job to spread the good news of Sabbath. However, at their general conference of 1841, the Seventh-day Baptists decided God required them to share the Seventh-day Sabbath truth. So in 1842, they formed tract societies and printed tracts to hand out. During the years 1843 to 1845, they had special days of fasting and prayer as they worked diligently to spread the good news of Sabbath. Rachel Oakes, a 30-year-old Seventh-day Baptist widow who lived in Washington, New Hampshire, was very diligent. In the spring of 1844, Rachel attended a communion on Sunday by Millerite preacher Frederick Wheeler. He said, all persons confessing communion with Christ in such a service should be ready to follow and obey God and keep his commandments in all things. Rachel Oakes confronted him afterwards and said, I came near getting up at that point in the meeting and saying something. Well, what was it you had on your mind to say, he asked. She said, I wanted to tell you that you'd better set the table back up and put the cloth over it until you're ready to keep all ten of God's commandments. Those words cut Wheeler deeply, and after studying the scripture, he soon began to keep Sabbath. He was the first Millerite minister to keep Sabbath. Rachel continued to work hard to convince the Millerite families in Washington, New Hampshire of the Sabbath, and a few accepted the Sabbath the fall of 1844. From here, word spread one by one. Another minister accepted the Sabbath message, who wrote to Joseph Bates, who spoke to Hiram Ed Edson and James and Ellen White, and soon there were Sabbath keepers spreading throughout the world. At the end of their three-year campaign, the Seventh-day Baptist Church reported they were very disappointed that Christian denominations rejected their evangelistic efforts of the Sabbath. But there was a noted exception that Millerite Adventists responded positively. Is it chance the only years the Seventh-day Baptists have spread the Sabbath truth was 1843 to 1845? I don't think so. That is God's perfect timing. Rachel Oaks felt like a failure as she attempted to spread the good news of the Sabbath truth. She planted seeds all over, but she did not see a quick, large harvest. She might have felt like a failure here while working, but I believe that when in heaven she sees the results of her labor, how far the Sabbath truth has spread, she is going to be thrilled. God created each one of us to have a relationship with him and to spread the gospel. We may feel small. We may feel like complete failures, but we are called to plant seeds of God's truth. We must not get discouraged and give up when we don't see a harvest. Today is the day to sow seed. Heaven is the time to reap. Yeah. 
One of my favorite stories is of a young boy by the name of Eugene Farnsworth who lived in that town of Washington, New Hampshire. The Farnsworth family accepted William Miller's message to prepare for Christ's soon coming. They also were the first Millerite family to accept the Sabbath truth, and their church was the first Sabbath-keeping Advent church, and they were on fire for God. But as the Seventh-day Adventist church began to organize, they began to have a bad attitude towards organization, and they were watching for any discipline or rebuke from Battle Creek as an excuse to rebel. By the 1860s, they had closed the church and backslidden into the world. In hopes of a revival, James and Ellen White and Jay and Andrews visited the town and the doors of the church were opened. Families came to criticize their words. As Ellen White got up at the pulpit, she was not happy with the message God gave her, but from the pulpit she began pointing out specific and secret sins one by one of those sitting in the pews. Eugene, as a youth who sat in the back, knew here was his test to know if Ellen White was a true prophet. They had been working in the woods together, and he had seen his father discreetly spit in the snow and cover it up, and he had not told a soul. Sure enough, Ellen White gave testimony of Mr. Farnsworth's secret chewing of tobacco. Him and the other adults repented and made a complete turn in their lives. The youth were then inspired, and they joined in a complete revival of that little church. Eighteen youth gave their lives to the Lord, and despite it being the end of December, twelve of them insisted on immediate baptism. A hole was cut one foot deep through the ice, and they were baptized in Millen Pond. The majority of those youth went on to spread the gospel with that type of commitment. Eugene was one of those youth. On another occasion, when Jay and Andrews came to his home, Eugene, who was extremely shy, quickly slipped out the door to go hoe corn. Mr. Andrews saw him, grabbed a hoe, and followed him out into the field. Eugene quickly saw that Mr. Andrews did not know a single thing about how to hoe corn, but he just kept silent and kept hoeing. Finally, Mr. Andrews said, Eugene, what is your purpose in life? Eugene said, well, I'm going to become a lawyer. Well, you might do a good deal worse, he said, and what are you going to do before that? Well, I'm going to go to school and get an education. Yes, and what next? Well, I hope to study law. Yes, and what next? Well, I hope to practice law. Yes, and what next? Well, I hope to get some money and a home and a family. Yes, and what next? At this, Eugene began to grow nervous because he saw exactly what it was. Well, I suppose I shall die. Again, Mr. Andrews replied, yes, and what next? My boy, you take hold of something, something that will help you span that chasm, something that will land your feet safe on the other side for eternity. Those words changed Eugene's life. He lived his life as a full-time missionary for Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, our time on earth is short. We, like Eugene, must make a decision today as to where we are going to spend eternity. Living the ways of the world while showing up at church every Sabbath is pure hypocrisy. We must take hold of Christ with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our minds so that we can live safely on the other side. We must live our lives with a purpose of being a full-time missionary wherever God places us. It isn't easy work. Ellen White definitely preferred a different method. It isn't easy work. Mr. Andrews had to grab a hoe and head out into the cornfield and pray for the wisdom of words with a youth. It isn't easy work. Eugene had to lay his shyness in the dust of that cornfield and speak boldly for the Lord. But the rewards of this kind of work are out of this world for eternity. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and that sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance that race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured that cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Christ who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you and I may not grow weary this evening. Let us dare to surrender all. Let us dare to live our lives for Jesus Christ. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many mighty men are lost. 
not daring not to stand who for god had been a host by joining daniel's band dare to be a daniel dare to stand alone dare to have a purpose firm dare to make it known many giants great and tall stalking through the land Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Hold the gospel banner high on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Dare to have a purpose firm. Joseph Bates was born in 1792 in Massachusetts. As a young boy with his home overlooking a very active shipping port, he dreamed of sailing and traveling the world. Finally, at the age of 15, against his parents' desires, he set forth on his first voyage. While at sea, he experienced many dangers. On one voyage, there was a shark swimming beside the ship, which was an omen that someone that day would fall overboard and be eaten. As he climbed the masthead, he lost his balance and he fell 60 feet into the ocean. A rope was thrown at him and at the last second, he barely managed to grab on and be pulled back to safety. Upon getting back on deck, he looked over the ship and there was the shark still swimming there. Later on, he was taken as a slave for several years in a ship, but despite all these things, he quickly advanced and he was soon captain and part ship owner. While at sea, God began to change his life. He loved to read, and on one of his voyages, his wife tucked a New Testament into his trunk. Bates returned home a Christian to the delight of his wife. He was convicted alcohol and cursing was wrong. Later, he threw his tobacco pipe into the ocean, and by the end of his life, he discarded tea and coffee. At the age of 36, he retired with what today would be equal to about a million dollars. During his retirement, he used his time and money to promote temperance and to oppose slavery. Later, when he heard Miller's message to prepare for Christ soon coming, he then poured his time and money into spreading that message. In 1845, Bates read an article about the Sabbath. He traveled from Fairhaven, Massachusetts to Washington, New Hampshire. Upon arriving by foot at the home of Pastor Frederick Wheeler in the middle of the night, he was so excited to study about the Sabbath that they stayed up the rest of the night. On his way back home, Bates crossed his friend there on the bridge and his friend hollered, Hey Bates, what news have you? Bates responded, the news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath. His friend responded, I'll have to read my Bible and see about that one. But the following Sabbath, they kept it together. He then spent his time and money promoting the Sabbath. In 1847, as Bates was writing his third tract on Sabbath, his wife Prudence told him that she needed flour. How much flour do you lack? He asked, four pounds. So Bates went to the store and returned with four pounds of flour. Prudence came in and demanded, have you, Captain Bates, a man who has sailed vessels out of New Bedford to all parts of this world, gone out to town today and returned with only four pounds of flour? Bates responded, wife, I spent for that the last money I have on earth. Bitterly, Prudence sobbed and exclaimed, what are we going to do? Bates stood to all his height as a captain and he said, I am going to write a book and I'm going to spread the Sabbath truth before the entire world. Well, said Prudence, and what are we going to live on in the meantime? The Lord will open the way, he said. That's what you always say, she said, as she burst into tears and left the room. About half an hour later, Bates felt impressed to go to the post office. Upon arriving at the post office, he found there a letter, but postage was due. He had no money, so the postmaster told him, just take the letter and pay me later. But being a man of high character, he refused, so the postmaster opened the letter. Out fell $10. Bates gave orders for barrels of food to be delivered to his wife. He strode back across that bridge and made arrangements for 1,000 of his Sabbath tracts to be printed. He went back home and sat down and continued to write. 
His wife came in and demanded, where did all of these barrels of food come from? The Lord sent it, he said. That's what you always say, she said. And he handed her the note that accompanied the money and she again left in tears. Brothers and sisters, how is our faith this evening? Do we love Jesus enough to give everything we have to share the wonderful news of Jesus Christ? Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Whoever sows to please from the fleshly desires, from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary while doing good. For at the right time, we are guaranteed to reap a harvest if we do not give up. This next song is a poem written by Annie Smith. It is thought that the first stanza refers to Joseph Bates, the second to James White, and the third to Jay and Andrews. I saw one weary, sad, and torn, with eager steps press on the way, who long the hollowed cross had borne, still looking for the promised day. While many a line of grief and care upon his brow was furrowed there, I asked what would his spirit suffer? Oh, this day. the Millerites in faith that Christ was coming did not harvest their potatoes. Instead, they spent their time spreading the good news of Christ soon coming. So did they starve then because of their misunderstanding? The potatoes that year in America were destroyed by the potato blight. But the Millerites still had potatoes in the ground they were able to dig up, eat through the winter, and sell for a high price. What about the misunderstanding of October 20 to 1844? Was William Miller crazy? Absolutely not. This was before internet and other fast communication. And there were other individuals in other countries studying their Bibles who saw that the 2300 day prophecy would be fulfilled in 1844. And they felt the personal need to prepare for Christ's soon coming. Were the Millerites foolish to think that Christ's coming was so soon? Not at all. Eve expected her first son Cain to be the Messiah. And when he murdered his brother, she then expected her next son Seth to be the Messiah. Soon God's people, though, gave up on an ever-returning Messiah. But a few people who were reading God's word knew when to expect the Messiah, and they were richly blessed to see and recognize Jesus Christ for exactly who he was. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his disciples thought that Christ was going to deliver them from Rome, but they were wrong. They lived through that great disappointment when Christ hung dead on the cross Friday afternoon. But when they realized that prophecy had been fulfilled, their great disappointment was turned into such a great joy that they spread the gospel to the entire world in that one generation. Christ's faithful children expected his return October 20 to 1844. 
They were mistaken as to what the cleansing of the sanctuary was. But soon after, just like the disciples, they saw that prophecy had been fulfilled, that Christ had entered the most holy place for the judgment to occur so that he can come again. As Christ judges, each child who repents and walks with Christ may have a cleared record and name written in that book of life. Brothers and sisters, the judgment is great news for us. We rejoice at the news of his clearing our record and coming soon to take us home. As we personally study deeply the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, we see that Christ is returning very soon. Let us each be ready for Christ's return. That Advent message still rings loud and clear just when we feel like giving up, just when we think that Jesus is never going to come, that midnight cry will sound, that trumpet of the Lord will be heard, and we indeed will see Jesus Christ coming with our very own eyes. with a shout and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with our Lord. I look around me I see prophecies fulfilled and so times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear my father as he says at the midnight at the midnight
brothers and sisters, that day is coming soon. And have we fallen asleep? That parable of the ten virgins, that's the church. And they were all sleeping. And I'm afraid that has been our state for a long time, is sleeping. And you know, as I ponder it, I notice that they all had some oil, which we consider that to represent the Holy Spirit. So they all had the Holy Spirit, but some of them were lost. Why? And as I pondered that, I thought, what does it take to get more Holy Spirit, and what does it take to be low on Holy Spirit? And it's that daily personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Am I listening to that voice, and am I disentangling myself from the sin when I'm convicted? so that I hear that voice convicting me more and more? Or when I hear that voice, am I cold-hearted and do I say, you know, that's a great idea maybe for some other time, some other year. I'm content with where I am right now. And so, you know, it's a call for me myself. What am I gonna do? God is convicting each one of us. That Holy Spirit is speaking to each one of his children. And he's calling us. He's calling us to lay aside the world and to enter into the joy of the Lord? Will we accept that free gift? Will we say, here am I, I want that gift? And will we walk into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? So if it's your desire like it is our families to say, you know what, it's time that we rise up. It's time that we awake to the calling of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Let me have a relationship with you. Let me spread the gospel so that you can come soon. If it's your desire to join us in that call, to just wake up in the morning, read our Bibles, disentangle ourselves when we hear that conviction from the Holy Spirit, and to just run that race towards Jesus Christ, spreading the gospel with everyone we can along the way, we invite you to stand up and come forward with us as we sing this last song of personal commitment. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Let's pray. Dear Lord, here we are. For on a Friday evening, Lord, we traveled some distance, my family and I, to come see these fine people here in Missouri. Lord, we know there's some exciting things for some of us going on Sunday. But Lord, what does it take for us to be that excited to open our Bible? Oh, that's a tough question. In 2013, I asked myself the same question, living where I live. What would it take for me to be, to be that excited to say, yes, God, I'm on your team. Lord, give us that charge. Give us that energy. Give us the, that hope to open our Bibles, to wear them out. So the day will come when we have to replace them because they won't stay together anymore. Lord, give us that courage. Lord, I pray for each person here that they will be touched each morning to get up, spend some time with you in the Word. I know, Lord, it's been a great blessing for our family. We're not perfect, Lord. We don't claim to be. 
but we're searching. Lord, give us all that desire to search for you. I thank you one more time for each person who came out this evening. In thy name, amen.